tells them that they can no longer promote marriage to these young girls. They can no longer promote marriage as a way of avoiding poverty and bad choices that they make in their life. They can no longer actually even teach abstinence education. They have to be neutral with respect to how people behave. The problem is neutrality ends in poverty. Neutrality ends in choices that hurt people's lives. This administration is deliberately telling organizations that are there to help young girls make good choices, not to tell them what the good choice is. That is absolutely unconscionable. Congressman Paul, an analysis by the Prison Policy Initiative finds that blacks who are jailed at four times the rates of whites in South Carolina are most often convicted on drug offenses. Do you see racial disparities in drug-related arrests and convictions as a problem? And if so, how would you fix it? Mm -hmm. uh, yes, definitely. There is a disparity. It's not that it's my opinion. It's, it's very clear. Uh, blacks and minorities who are involved with drugs are arrested disproportionately. Uh, they're tried, they're imprisoned disproportionately. Uh, they suffer the consequence of the death penalty disproportionately. Rich white people don't get the death penalty very often. And uh, most of these are victimless crimes. Sometimes people can use drugs and arrest it three times and never committed a violent act, and they can go to prison for life. And yet we see times, just recently we heard, where uh, actually murderers get out of prison in shorter periods of time. So I think it's way, way disproportionate. I don't think we can do a whole lot about it. I think there's discrimination in the system, but you have to address the drug war. You know, the drug war is, is very violent on our borders. We have the immigration problem, and I'm all for having, uh, you, you know, tight immigration policies, but we can't ignore the border without looking at the drug war. In the last five years, 47,500 people died in the drug war down there. This is a major thing going on, and it unfairly hits the minority. This is one thing I am quite sure that uh, Martin Luther King would be in agreement with me on this. Matter of fact, Martin Luther King would be in agreement with me on the wars as well because he was a strong uh, opponent to the Vietnam War. So I, I, uh, I would say yes, this judicial system is probably one of the worst places where, uh, 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 where, where prejudice and, and discrimination still exists in this country. Speaker Gingrich. You recently said black Americans should demand jobs, not food stamps. You also said poor kids lack a strong work ethic and proposed having them work as janitors in their schools. Can't you see that this is viewed at a minimum as insulting to all Americans, but particularly to black Americans? No, I don't see that. My daughter, Jackie, who's sitting back there, Jackie Cushman, reminded me that her first job was at First Baptist Church in Carrollton, Georgia, doing janitorial work at 13. And she liked earning the money. She liked learning that if you worked, you got paid. She liked being in charge of her own money. And she thought it was a good start. I had a young man in uh, New Hampshire who walked up to me. I've, I've written two newsletters now about this topic. I've had over 50 people write me about the jobs they got at 11, 12, 13 years of age. Ran into a young man who started a donut company at 11. He's now 16. He has several restaurants that take his donuts. His father's thrilled that he's 16 because he can now deliver his own donuts. <laughs> um, what I tried to say, and I think it's fascinating because Joe Klein reminded me that this started with an article he wrote 20 years ago. New York City pays their janitors an absurd amount of money because of the union. You could take one janitor and hire 30-some kids to work in the school for the price of one janitor, and those 30 kids would be a lot less likely to drop out. They would actually have money in their pocket. They'd learn to show up for work. They could do light janitorial duty. They could work in the cafeteria. They could work in the front office. They could work in the library. They'd be getting money, which is a good thing if you're poor. Only the elites despise or earning money. The governor. Speaker Gingrich. 
the suggestion that you made was about a lack of work ethic. And I gotta tell you, my email account, my Twitter account has been inundated with people of all races who are asking if your comments are not intended to belittle the poor and racial minorities. You saw some of this reaction during your visit to a black church in South Carolina. You saw some of this during your visit to a black church in South Carolina where a woman asked you why you refer to President Obama as the food stamp president. It sounds as if you are seeking to belittle people. Well, first of all, Juan, the fact is that more people have been put on food stamps by Barack Obama than any president in American history. Now, I know among the politically correct, you're not supposed to use facts that are uncomfortable. Now, second, you are the one who earlier raised a key point. There's a, the area that ought to be I-73 was called by Barack Obama a corridor of shame because of unemployment. Has it improved in three years? No. They haven't built the road, they haven't helped the people, they haven't done anything. So, Finish your talk, so, Mr. Speaker. One, one last thing. Yes, sir. So here's my point. I believe Every American of every background has been endowed by their creator with the right to pursue happiness. And if that makes liberals unhappy, I'm going to continue to find ways to help poor people learn how to get a job, learn how to get a better job, and learn someday to own the job. Okay. When we come back, they can't hear me, but I'll talk to you. Tweet me your questions. At Brett Baer, include hashtag SCDebate after this break. Welcome back to Myrtle Beach, South Carolina. That was a time-lapse video of a sand sculpture right outside the convention center here. It does still have Governor Huntsman on that sand sculpture. He's not here tonight. Next round of questions is on foreign policy, and we'll begin with Congressman Paul. In a recent interview, Congressman Paul, with the Des Moines radio station, you said you were against the operation that killed Osama bin Laden. You said the U.S. operation that took out the terrorists responsible for killing 3,000 people on American soil, quote, showed no respect for the rule of law, international law. So to be clear, you believe international law should have constrained us from tracking down and killing the man responsible for the most brazen attack on the U.S. since Pearl Harbor? Obviously no, and that's what, I did not say that. What I, matter of fact, uh, after 9-11, I voted for the authority to go after him. And uh, my, my frustration was that uh, we didn't go after him. It took us 10 years. We had him trapped at Tora Bora, and I thought we should have trapped him there. I even introduced another resolution on uh, the principle of market reprisal to keep our eye on the target rather than getting involved in nation building. But, but the, you, you know, no respect for international law was the question about the quote that you used in Des Moines. Well, you know, uh, KSM, uh, his colleague, was, uh, was in, in uh, Pakistan, and we communicated, you know, with the uh, government of Pakistan, and they turned them over. And uh, what, we, what I suggested there was that if we have no respect for the sovereignty of another nation, that it will lead to disruption of that nation. Here we have a nation that we're bombing constantly, trying to kill people that we consider our enemies. At the same time, we're giving the government of Pakistan billions of dollars. Now there's a civil war going on. The people are mad at us, but yet the government is, they're getting money from us. And I think it's a deeply flawed policy. 
and but to not go after him uh, and if, if I voted for the authority obviously I think it was proper I it, but once they waited 10 years uh, I don't see any reason why they they couldn't have uh, done it like they did after Khalid Sheikh Haman it Haman it and that uh, that would have been a more proper way now if if somebody has a somebody in this country say a Chinese dissident comes over here we wouldn't endorse the idea well they can come over here and bomb us and do whatever I'm just trying to suggest that respect for other nations sovereignty and look at the chaos in Pakistan sure. now we're at war in Pakistan but to say that I didn't want him killed and no, didn't vote for the authority, I, I just quoted from I'm your just radio. Suggesting, I'm just suggesting that there are processes that if you can follow and you should do it, there's proper procedures, rather than digging bigger holes for ourselves. That's what we have been doing in the Middle East, digging bigger and bigger holes for ourselves, and it's so hard for us to get ourselves out of that mess, right. we're, and we have a long way to go. We are still in Iraq, and that's getting worse, and we're not leaving Afghanistan, and the American people are sick and tired of it. Eighty percent of the American people want us out of there. I'm just suggesting that we work within the rule of law. Like like only going to war when you declare the war, then we in wouldn't be in inter trapped in international law. I understand. Well, I guess U.S. intelligence officials say they had documents recovered in that compound in Abbottabad that showed that Al Qaeda was planning other attacks, perhaps bigger than 9/11. I asked you in our debate in Sioux City on the topic of Iran about this, but on this topic, GOP nominee Ron Paul would be running far to the left of President Obama on the issue of tracking down and killing terrorists who want to attack the U.S. Well, I, w I would say that uh, if, if you do your best and you can't do anything, yes, we had the authority, we voted for it, you got it from the Congress, you do it. I just didn't think that they had gone through the process enough to actually, you know, capture him in a different way. I mean, think about Saddam Hussein. You know, we did that. We, we captured him. And we tried him, I mean, the government tried him, and he hung, got hung. What's, what's so terrible about this? This whole idea that you can't capture, just a minute, right? just a minute. What's this whole idea that you can't capture people? Uh, but just you think voted of, against the war in Iraq. Just, just think, Adolf Eichmann was captured, he was given a trial. What's wrong with capturing people? Why didn't we try to get some information from him? You know, we're, we're accustomed to asking people questions, but all of a sudden, gone, you know, uh, th that's it. So I would say that uh, there are different ways without trying to turn around and say, oh, for some reason this doesn't mean he's supporting, supporting okay. America. Or Speaker Gingrich, like if, if you receive Speaker Gingrich actionable intelligence about the location of Taliban leader Mullah Mohammed Omar inside Pakistan, would you authorize a unilateral operation much like the one that killed bin Laden? with or without the Pakistani government knowing, even if the consequence was an end to all U.S.-Pakistani cooperation? Well, let me go back to set the stage as you did a while ago. Bin Laden plotted deliberately bombing American embassies, bombing the USS Cole, and killing 3,100 Americans, and his only regret was he didn't kill more. Now, he's not a Chinese dissident. You know, the, the analogy that Congressman Paul used was, was utterly irrational. A Chinese dissident who comes in here, a, a Chinese dissident who comes here seeking freedom is not the same as a terrorist who goes to Pakistan seeking asylum. Furthermore, when you give a country $20 billion and you learn that they have been hiding, I mean, nobody, in their, nobody believes that bin Laden was sitting in a compound in a military city one mile from the National Defense University, and the Pakistanis didn't know it. Now, we're in South Carolina. South Carolina in the Revolutionary War had a young 13-year-old named Andrew Jackson. He was sabered by a British officer and wore a scar his whole life. Andrew Jackson had a pretty clear-cut idea about America's enemies. Killed them. Congressman Paul, 30 seconds, please. 30 seconds to respond, since you were mentioned. My, my, my point is, is if another country does to us 
what we do others, we're not going to like it very much. So I would say that maybe we ought to consider a golden rule in, uh, in foreign policy. Don't do to other nations what we don't want to have them do to us. So we, we, endlessly bomb, we endlessly bomb these countries and then we wonder, wonder why they get upset with us. And, uh, and, and yet it's, it continues on and on. I mean, uh, this